Uh, uh, right. So the challenge of impact tolerance. <coughs> Lessons of multifunctional architecture for biological materials. Uh, so I start with a few rhetorical questions here. Uh, I won't go through them, but basically they list uh, a number of problems in structural materials. I mean, these are these are all things that I would love to see, and. Uh, the problem is designers don't have the materials to solve these problems. Um, and so we can start with uh, one of the best materials we have currently, the closest we can get to solving them. Um, in, in the interest of uh, making a lightweight, uh, stiff, and, and tough composite, which is what you need for a bicycle, uh, the best we have currently is a carbon fiber reinforced um, epoxy. However, it's clearly not good enough. Uh, so uh, another, another quick example is um, Body Armor, which the, this company will tell you that they're the best, but the US military refuses to use them because apparently uh, it has low reliability. So instead, they go with something that says handle with care, which uh, considering it's supposed to stop a high velocity round, you can't drop it. So this is a, clearly an example of a material that's highly specialized. Um, so one. Uh, one example of uh, that I think is nice to start with in terms of what, what can be achieved with a, a biological material is to compare the calcium carbonates like calcite, calcite and aragonite, which are in this lower circle, to uh, seashell, which I know it's hard to read, but this is a logarithmic scale. And so you can get a three orders of magnitude increase in toughness with a very marginal decrease in modulus just by changing the geometry and the architecture of a material and adding a little bit of protein and or adding a little bit of organic and that organic is certainly neither tough nor tougher nor um, nor does it have a higher modulus than the, than the, than the final material so if we uh, look at how this how this works the uh, here's an example of what I just talked about, what I just spoke of and uh, it's inside you know, it looks very pretty as we've, we've all seen it all these iridescent layers and this is from this highly, highly organized architecture. And people have proposed many different regimes for why this is so tough. And uh, the people who have proposed the different regimes will argue over which one's more important, but uh, I presume that they're all important. And so just to go through them quickly, you can, when you're pulling these tablets apart, instead of just creating one catastrophic fracture in a monolithic material, these uh, these platelets will, f will break off these little nubs, these nanosperities, and they'll stretch hidden length proteins, and they'll break mineral bridges. And all of these mechanisms together will dissipate very large amounts of energy. However, the peacock mantis shrimp smashes and eats these organisms. So that's going to be what we're looking at today. And I'm going to try and do a quick movie. I, I normally try to avoid movies, but this one is particularly spectacular. So I'll try and find it really quick. When you're vibrating as much as I am, it's hard to type. All right. uh, let's see. <laughs> okay. There we go. That's unfortunate. Okay. <laughs> and like I said, I avoid movies. All right. So mantis shrimp, they're known mostly for having extraordinary eyes, and this is what motivated research uh, for many years. Um, people have some of the best eyes with respect to resolution. Eagles can certainly see very far. Mantis shrimp have some of the most amazing diversity of color receptors. So you know we see uh, with three different receptors, three primaries, these guys have 12 to 16, depending on species, and can see linear and circular polarization. Um, but we're interested in these guys over here. They come in two flavors, the smashers and the slashers, or spears, more colloquially. Uh, the spears came first, and somewhere along their evolution, I guess they just started to accidentally elbow people, and they started to develop this very bulbous uh, club right here. And, and this is what they used to smash open um, 
smash open shellfish so they can just pulverize them into bits. So here's a force displacement curve mixed with a, uh, um, taken from a piezoelectric sensor that was attached to a snail. So this uh, creature came, comes up and starts wailing on the, on the snail. And the, uh, you can see that this is actually just one hit, but there's two spikes. And the reason is because it moves so fast through the water, it actually cavitates the medium. So it, it moves fast enough to boil the water around its fist, and the collapse of those bubbles creates such a destructive force that it's on, uh, around 200 newtons. As you can see. Um, and if we look at the uh, micro CT scan, we can see at the very top, it's pretty easy to distinguish its exoskeleton from uh, the, organ the, in the internal organic. And these things have to fight each other and all sorts of other threats. And that tiny, thin little layer of uh, mineralized exocuticle is, is sufficient to protect itself. And yet, it then decides to put a gigantic rock on its fist in order to break through other materials. And so the way that it actually gets this thing accelerated is it stores elastic potential energy in a hyperbolic paraboloid that acts as a spring, which you can see up there in the S. And then uh, it releases a latch mechanism, and all that elastic potential energy will get converted into kinetic energy and slime into its prey. So we take a, uh, a typical biomimetic approach, I suppose, but I call it the biomimetic funnel, where we make predictions based on evolutionary theory and existing observations. Um, make a lot of characterization of its structure and properties, ultimately uh, simulate, the, uh, simulate the structures to try and um, recreate the, reproduce the properties, and then this will lead to um, synthetic, uh, synthetic systems and hopefully uh, application. So a few things that we can say about the club from S process one is that in order to deliver energy and momentum to something, uh, it's proportional to the difference in the modulus between those two objects. So it needs to be as stiff as possible because it's, has, it's combating very stiff prey. So it must be very stiff and, and very hard. But then it also must be very tough and very strong in order to mitigate the damage from that equal and opposite force. So these, two, these four things together, I mean, that's a gap in material space. Um, so if we look at a club cross-section here, so here's the... Oops, Here's the organism there in B, and then uh, its club is in C, and then we've taken a cross-section in that arrow, and that leads to a little schematic representation of the different types of substructural diversity and regional diversity that you find within the club. Um, there's really a lot that could be said about all these different regions, but today I'm going to be primarily focusing on the periodic region because I, th I find it to be one of the, I think it has solved one of the most interesting challenges in that the impact region has got to be hard, and we actually know pretty decently how to make hard materials. But making, but the periodic region is where the, the failure would form and nucleate, and so this material has to be very tough, and toughness is very difficult, especially when you're receiving tensile forces. Um, so the characterization begins with uh, some synchrotron. Um, we took a, a large array of diffractograms, and this little black box here is one, one diffractogram. Uh, and you can see that the 002 axis is aligned. So if I take a, a collection of points, uh, you can see down the center of this hard exterior. Um, uh, and then I could take those color-coded uh, borders and arrange them around in a dais. And you'll notice that the, zero, the 002 axis is, uh, is changing its orientation as we move around in this, this dais. And then if I map those two where the locations they were taken, you can see it's always orthogonal to the surface. And so I can do that more programmatically, and you can see that that trend continues throughout the crystalline exterior of the club. And this is a very common design motif in any sort of impact or load-bearing material is to have a hard exterior and a tough interior. So its tough interior, though, takes a completely different phase. Um, and so if we look at EDS, which is not shown, but um, there's a rather smooth transition of uh, of the actual elemental composition, but it's able to make a very abrupt crystalline transition. And so the, the theory proposed, the hypothesis proposed as to why you'd want um, a crystalline exterior is because crystals are hard. But an amorphous phase is actually easier to redirect and control a fracture because you know, you're not limited to cleavage planes. And why that's important will become hopefully more obvious. 
So if we look into this interior, um, a polished cross section, we see this characteristic C, C pattern. There's clearly chirality here. Um, and, uh, but a fractured surface is much more telling. And it's clear that we have what they call rotated plywood. And this structure will go by many different names. Um, engineers have called it an isotropic composite or quasi-isotropic composite. Um, other engineers on smaller scales have called it a CST, SM, uh, continuously twisted structurally chiral medium. Um, these people really don't seem to be talking to each other because they don't reference each other much. Uh, and that also goes by helicoidal composite or uh, Bulugan structure and after the person who first described these structures. And I'm sure I'm mispronouncing the French name. Uh, so one of the, the striking things, though, is this is, uh, this is the standard structural motif of all arthropods. And it's uh, probably one of the most convergent, if not the most convergent structure known to man. Uh, it's been independently evolved in, with collagen and in in chordates, with uh, um, certainly chitin in arthropods, and then uh, cellulose in plants. But one of the most striking things about this, just from this picture, is the scale bar. Um, the, the pitch, uh, which is the amount of distance you need to travel to make a 180 degree rotation or, th or 360 degree rotation. But what you're seeing here is these, these lines. So every line is 180 degree rotation. The pitch would be defined as 360 degrees. Uh, that pitch is so much larger than what you typically find. Um, normally, 10 microns is about the upper limit. There's certainly things higher than that. But this can get up as, as large as 300 microns. Uh, and it's a, this very graded architecture, which we'll get back to. So one of the, the first things we wanted to do was uh, in looking at this and um, looking at this fracture surface, it's very difficult to determine where the fibers begin and the matrix ends. Uh, and so with synchrotron, because the uh, mineral phase is amorphous, it was very easy to distinguish between the mineral phase and the crystalline chitin. So taking a line scan along that white bar down the, the central axis of the club, um, right here being the impact surface. Um, the, uh, we could take all these traces around the 110 uh, reflection of chitin and stack them on top of each other and using some work by, that was uh, developed by uh, Helga uh, and then later further developed by Paris and Mueller. Um, you can actually calculate the micro, you can calculate the angle of a fiber from a single diffractogram in 3D space. And we can make a reconstruction then from all of these diffractograms and reconstruct the, the entire helicoid right up until the fiber gets a little bit too close to the beam, which is what you're seeing in that white box, and the, uh, the technique breaks down. But um, so basically, we've just confirmed the, the structural motif of, uh, of arthropods. And it's, uh, here we're looking at just the organic, and then if this is a uh, um, if this is a non-crustacean arthropod, then there would be cross-links that form um, in the form of sclerotization. And if it's a, a, a crustacean, then you would have mineralization on top of this motif, which is uh, likely and been proposed to be a cholesteric liquid crystal that self-assembles and then is rigidified. Uh, and so if we look at the nanoindentation line scan down the center, you can see, again, confirming that it's very, very hard at the impact surface and then graded, and then it follows a abrupt modulus mismatch, and then you have a periodic modulus. And if we plug all these values into, uh, from, the, from the map into a dyna dynamic finite element analysis, and then impact it with a, um, with a force and velocity uh, comparable to what you'd expect from, uh, from the, the actual organic situation, um, then you get uh, forces a hydrostatic compression uh, upwards of six gigapascals, which some of you may know that exceeds the strength of zirconium. So that's clearly impossible. Um, and what, what I think this tells us is not that we've got it right, but that if we put in just the simple basic uh, values that nanodentation spits out and then plug those into the simulation, we're clearly wrong. And so this, this proves that the microarchitecture is important. And somehow having to distribute these forces uh, otherwise, it would be um, much more incredible than anybody else. So um, one of the things we wanted to do then was get, get, a, get deeper into detail and say the, um, this periodic modulus. And so we took a, a mesh of points, collapsed them down, and we, have, we can um, 
we can see that the modulus varies between 10 and 25. So not huge, but it should be enough to create shielding domains and uh, which could arrest, arrest fractures. Um, and, and so when we look at this charge contrast image compared to the backscattered image, it allows you to very easily see all of the microfracturing occurring within the sample. And uh, you know this, this looks to very much confirm exactly what we're saying, where you have um, these arresting domains. So you have these little microfractures appearing, but then getting arrested. Um, and then if we look at uh, a coronal cross-section, we see something very puzzling, which is also a lot of these microfractures. But if we're looking at a layered architecture, you'd assume that a layered architecture over a curved surface that's kind of like an onion. And when you, cross, when you make a cross-section through an onion, you'd expect to get concentric rings. But if I false color this, the pattern that pops out is a double spiral. And that's, that's quite puzzling. But uh, we can make sense of this because um, by taking a rotated plyoid architecture, curving it around a surface, and then again, now we get the, the onion that we would expect if we alternate the color of every ring. But if we make and we change our color scheme, then we can completely reproduce the pattern that we, th that we found in the club. And the takeaway here is that the, the pattern of the fractures, which we're seeing from the charge contrast image, exactly re uh, is reproduced by n doing nothing but simulating the fibers. So what that tells me is that the fibers are controlling the fractures. So the fractures are always traveling between fibers. So when I look back at this picture, what I think is going on is not actually that fractures are being arrested, but rotating out of the plane of the polished surface. And so to confirm that, we made a, we printed a, um, a helicoidal composite, and we didn't have access to a multi-material printer, but the support material was used as the as the matrix, and then the actual uh, intended to be printed material was used as the fibers, just to create a sufficient modulus mismatch. So this is obviously not mimetic, but it is uh, at least indicative, or it's uh, representative of the structure at a at a very um, at a very basic level. And so then we put it into a, a three-point bend, and you can see that the fracture was in fact rotated. And most importantly, the stress-strain curve is actually, or the load displacement curve here, is actually increasing. And this is very strange because typically for a fracture, you will have a decreasing force because it becomes easier to drive a fracture the, the, as, you open, as you create a larger crack open angle. And so this is uh, the, the power of a helicoidal composite is that it can, uh, by twisting the fracture, you actually increase the driving force for fracture propagation. Um, and so, uh, but another, uh, and one place that we got lucky here is that this wouldn't have worked if the bonding between the fibers and the matrix wasn't sufficiently strong. Uh, and that's kind of, that's kind of intriguing as well because if you think of fiber reinforced composites and the, the current status quo and the thinking of why we make fiber reinforced composites, it's to enhance the toughness of your epoxy. Um, or whatever you're, whatever you're using as your matrix, but one of the most predominant mechanisms is fiber pullout. And there's been a lot of work to tune the oxidation of glass fibers such that uh, you, the friction between the matrix and the fiber is such that it's just under the strength of the fiber. And what, what, what that means is that you want to you wanna have it as strong as possible such that you dissipate as much friction energy as possible while you're pulling your fiber out but then you don't want it to exceed that value, the, the, the strength of the fiber because otherwise you sever it. Well, that's, that's actually what's going on here. So the bonding is, is far better than the strength of the fibers. And so in this fracture surface, we see no evidence of fiber pullout, which would look like exposed fibers and uh, canals where there was clearly debonding. And so what this suggests is that there's actually a completely different mechanism going on in this, fiber, this type of fiber reinforced composite than what humans currently do. Um, and to understand it, I think you just need to. Uh, there's just two components that are uh, that are synergizing, and that and that really is the 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 one takeaway that I would really hope that you guys get from this talk, uh, and and maybe spark a discussion would be uh, the helicoidal composite causes the redirection of fractures, but then the the se the second feature that's crucial is the microporosity. So without the microporosity, then you get something like what we just had before, where it, it'll rotate the fracture, but then it'll rotate it to the point where you reach a, um, we have no choice but to start severing fibers, and so you do. And so you really just have a marginal increase in toughness, because all you've done is 
mildly increase, increase the tortuosity of the fracture. You just increase the, the fracture surface area. But this is what's clever about, uh, about life, is it does things that we would never think to do, and that we try and remove all sources of failure. And what this organism has done has said, if you can't beat it, join it. Put the failure everywhere. And, um, and so I'll explain why, that, why you would want to do that. Uh, so that you can see, this is a demineralized surface. And there's a, a very small little delamination here. And I've zoomed in, and so you can see a single layer of, uh, of chitin. And it's just littered with, uh, with microporous channels that go through the thickness of the, of, the fi of the fiber layers. And to me, it looks indicative of, uh, it looks something like expanded metal, which is, that's what that picture is. And it's certainly a lot easier to see when you demineralize, but if you um, ion polish, in this case, this is transverse, so this is parallel to this first picture. Uh, then you see, then you see these um, these microporous channels, and we ion polish because typical polishing would uh, would fill these porous channels in with with material with the abraded material. So now I'll try and take some time to to really uh, detail why it is that these two these two effects synergize. So first we just start with a a basic model of a helicoidal composite, and I reduce that model down to just two parallel fibers per layer. And what this represents is the path of a fracture. Just imagine a fracture traveling between these two, uh, these two fibers in each layer. Now, um, just that alone, you'd expect it to, uh, to travel, and so it basically follows a, a helicoidal surface. But now we, just, we can consider each of the ways that this helicoid can grow individually. So let's constrain the radial direction and just consider the longitudinal direction. Um, what we have here, if there was a fracture in the middle here, that's basically the pore channel. So the material begins loaded with fractures, um, is a way to think of that. And then, and, but that's not a problem because this is just little hairs. This, none of these are catastrophic. None of them uh, are propagating in, through the material such that they cleave the material in half and create catastrophe. Um, but then the opposite of this would be, let's consider now a fracture that's growing radially, but not, uh, but not Longitudinally, and so now what you see happens is that in order to travel between these two uh, these, these two fibers, as you increase your radial distance, then it has to traverse a large a larger uh, um, a larger distance this way around the circumference, and uh, and what that does is it actually the, the further you get out, the the less angle you have, and if we think about how this club is is loaded, when you uh, when you impact. We've, the finite element model at least predicted that there's um, biaxial stresses forming uh, laterally away from the, the, the point of impact. And, you, and that's sort of obvious if you just consider a Poisson's ratio. Uh, and so if it's a biaxial stress that's driving these fractures, as we rotate the angle, then that means the driving force is actually diminishing um, to the point where it becomes easier to propagate a new fracture from a new seed instead of continuing the old fracture. And so instead of your fractures becoming unstable because you're increasing the crack opening angle, they become stabilized and then reinitiated. So if we then consider uh, and to increase this depth a bit, then you can see another mechanism, which is that if we, uh, <clears throat> if we consider growth in the, in the vertical direction that's from something that's already grown radially, which is the last regime we would have to consider, um, you can see that the, there's something interesting about a helicoidal composite that maybe isn't completely obvious, and that's that there really is no central axis. So it's a translationally symmetric composite, so you can choose anywhere you want, and that's an axis for a helicoid. So the, the, because fractures are a local phenomena, there's no reason for a fracture to actually stick to one specific helicoid. When, so it doesn't need, so if we consider a fracture, um, we consider a fracture that initiated from this one, it doesn't, it doesn't have to match up and come over to this guy. It would just, as soon as it crosses through this delamination zone and then finds this, this hole here, it's going to take this one. And so what that means is that you have a, a fracture branching mechanism. And so to, to use my hands, which seems to be a theme of this symposium, uh, if, you, if I'm a fracture and I'm growing this way, and the longer I get this way, instead of me twisting around like this, it's easier just to split and become two fractures now propagating through the, through the thickness of the material. And so this process can keep on happening as well. And so we have a fracture splitting. And so um, obviously, the more fractures you have, the more energy you're dissipating. 
and especially if you can keep if you can keep any of the all, any of those fractures from becoming catastrophic, then you can dissipate a, a vast amount of energy through the volume of your material, because all of the the material all of the bonds within your material then become sacrificial, or potentially sacrificial. But there's one problem, and that's that uh, unlike a lot of really uh, interesting insights that we've learned from biomaterials, this one is not scalable, and, and that's because in order for in order for that mechanism to work, um, you will begin severing fibers if the, the local stress exhibited by one fracture doesn't isn't able to hop to a new to a new pore. So, uh, and that's you can and that's just simply because the the stress surrounding a fracture is proportional to inversely proportional to your distance from the the, the fracture front. So you'd always need a new pore to be located next to your fracture front or sufficiently close to your fracture front such that it feels a sufficiently strong stress in order to be exceeding the strength of the material to initiate a new fracture and to arrest the old which because you're relieving the stress of the, of the previous fracture and so um, here's basically this mechanism in action and the, from these charge contrast images you see i mean i don't know how to estimate this but I don't know, square kilometers of fracture <laughs> fracture surface area i don't know uh, but they're just riddled with fractures, and, and yet if you trace any of these fractures with your eyes, not a single one of them propagates to the edge of the material. And so the structural integrity of this bulk composite is not compromised. Um, uh, how am I doing on time? Five minutes? Okay, I'm going to skip all this. So this is a supporting feature that's told us something about the evolution of the material, which is interesting, but... I think I'll end on um, the uh, another multifunctional purpose of this helicoidal composite, at least in the case of a, a green beetle, is similar to the structural color from photonics. It's able to create uh, a structural color using the chirality of the the frozen cholesteric liquid crystal, and it'll reflect light um, with a wavelength comparable to the pitch of the of the, of the uh, comparable to the helicoidal pitch. And this is uh, very analogous to these thermally changing cholesteric liquid crystals that you'll see where as you heat it up, you, your thermal contraction or expansion will, uh, uh, will change the pitch and therefore the color. Um, but similarly, in, in the same way that uh, there's an analogy between photonics and phononics, there's an analogy between this optical phenomena and an acoustic phenomena. And so it's very likely that because the stress wave induced by this, uh, this severe impact is um, being able to resist the acoustic forces, not just the blunt impact, is very important for this organism. And so I don't know if it's going on, but it would be amazing if the reason that there's this puzzling gradient in the pitch that we don't really see in most, uh, most systems where you know, this, this, uh, this helicoidal motif is ubiquitous, but a graded helicoidal motif is, is not especially a, a gradation of this large. But the acoustic band gap created by a helicoidal composite is, again, proportional to the pitch. And so by grading the pitch, you, could grade, you can extend your band gap. And so the amount of forbidden waves that could pass into this material would be vastly broadened. And so in the same structural motif, we have something that's stiff, hard, ultra-tough, acoustically reflective, impact and shock tolerant, and then there's nothing prohibiting the material since it, we can't say for sure if, if the organism is taking uh, advantage of this acoustic reflection phenomena. But um, we could certainly imagine creating a material like this and ourselves taking advantage of it. And if we did so, this material architecture is not, um, it would be certainly compatible with the, the mechanisms for self-healing that we're aware of. It'd be, uh, it could be lightweight and cholesteric liquid crystals self-assemble. And so really the only thing that's missing is scalability, and that's simply because you're, you're constrained in how far you can separate your pores. Um, and then uh, another interesting uh, thing that I'll end on before, well, close to end on, is um, because this is, again, the structural motif of its entire exoskeleton, the spring that it uses to store all of that elastic potential energy is also using rotated plywood. But you can see that this is uh, a striking difference from what I, what I showed you earlier. And so there's a, a great deal of parameters within a helicoidal composite, and it appears that these parameters are being tuned to, for very different functions. Um, and so if we, if we could further understand this, then potentially we could tune them ourselves and also serve uh, a very large degree of functions. I won't read these, but the, the last thing I'll say is that 
um, assuming this hypothesis is true, um, one thing that you would predict is that everywhere that you find helicoidal composites, which is all over nature, you would also find five to ten micron spaced uh, por um, microporous channels. And that seems to always be the case. But uh, I won't steal Ron's thunder, but it appears that there's actually uh, more than one way to concentrate stress than just avoid. So uh, it's a teaser for Ron's talk. So.